Welcome back to the Phil Rosenberg Show. I am your host, Phil Rosenberg, and I have a very interesting guest for the season that we're in right now. Alan Bellick, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. All right, so check this out. Hanukkah Sameach, that means Happy Hanukkah in Hebrew. Habarigani, that means good day in Swahili and is what you're supposed to say every day of Kwanzaa to the person that you're seeing. Uh, let's see, Merry Christmas, everyone knows what that means. But all of these holidays have a bunch of similarities. But one thing that they have in common that is perhaps my favorite thing is that they all are celebrations of wine as well and require really wine in many cases to enjoy them fully. So I want to, which is we're coming into that part of the year, I want to talk about these holidays. And Alan, I know that you are an absolute master of pairings. And so we're going to get to that. Uh, but just right now, I want you, I want everyone to know a little bit about your history. Okay. So you've written a book that is available on Amazon, by the way, for everyone. Go grab it immediately. A guide to choosing, serving, and enjoying wine. You are, you write a column for the Napa Registry biweekly. Yes, I do. Biweekly. That's right. And I think you're considered a foremost expert on wine. I, uh, you certainly, uh, you really are considered authoritative. You, you consult for corporations, you give lectures on cruises. And as I mentioned, you've written a book about it. I mean, how much more really is there to know that you don't? Well, that's the interesting question, Phil, because wine is a never ending subject. And the more you learn, the more you forget you didn't learn the rest. So I'm learning something new in, in almost four or actually over 40 years of going in and out of wineries. I've never once gone into a winery where I haven't learned something new. Huh, and that and that includes today. OK. Fantastic. You know, there's always something more to learn. Okay, so let's get right into it. Let's dig. I got a list of foods here for you, Alan. Each of them pertain to a specific holiday. So like I have five foods for Kwanzaa, five foods for Hanukkah, and five foods for Christmas. And I would like you to pair up a wine for each of those foods. You ready? Uh, I'll, uh, Phil, I'll, I'll do my best on that. And we can sort of explore this as we go along, because as you said, uh, throughout the year, I spend my time with very, very formal food and wine pairing, lunches, dinners, and events, dozens of them during the year. Yeah. And I look at the holidays as a little bit more freewheeling because there's so many things on every plate. I'll, I'll do my best to give you pairings, but we also have to remember that when you have all these different foods on your plate at once, you want something that's just fun. Okay, so, so all right, let's do it a little differently. How about this? Instead of giving you individual foods and you pair for that food, why don't I give you a list of foods for that holiday? And we'll just imagine that all those foods are potential on the table. And then you can just give me like that sounds... one wine, five wines, 10 wines. That's good. Okay, That's let's good. do that. Okay, so let me start with Kwanzaa. I should first mention that according to thefoodnetwork.com, Kwanzaa food at its simplest is any dish people cook for Kwanzaa. And that quote unquote, the vast majority of what we see is some combination of sub-Saharan, African, East and West, soul food and coastal dishes of the Atlantic Rim with clearly traceable roots to Africa or African-Americans. So there's, that's really a universe of food and it's kind of hard to narrow it down. But what I've got yes. here is I've got five of them. Okay. I'm gonna throw them out to you and you tell me what I should serve on my table for dinner with these foods, okay? Sure. Okay. We have catfish, collards, jerk chicken, all kinds of curry dishes, and Ghanaian ground nut stew. Well, that that's an that's an interesting question because the the as I see it, all those dishes have some commonality to them, although they're in different preparations. Uh, the commonalities that I see are like the herbaceousness from the collards and spice at different levels from different sources and different dishes. And, you know, when I think of pairing foods and wines, I think of looking at either you, com you contrast it, in other words, a bright acidic wine with a very sweet dish, or you pair it, uh, you know, complement it, such as a very sweet wine with a very sweet dish. And in, in, when I, encounter spices, especially and herbaceousness, I think in terms of bright acidic wines that match the flavors, but they have to have some sweetness to match the spice. And so 
if I were to pick wines for that, and I don't know how many of these dishes are going to end up on the same plate at the same time, which is, you know, a commonality of the holidays. So if, if I think of what am I going to have that's going to, you know, tame the spice and also, uh, you know, complement the herbaceousness, I think of maybe something like a, an off-dry Gewürztraminer or an off-dry Riesling. Uh, there, there's that little bit of, or even an off-dry Chenin Blanc. When you say, uh, pardon me, when you say off-dry, what does that mean exactly? Off-dry, in other words, dry is not the parched feeling you get in your mouth when you drink a wine. Dry is the absence of sugar. So when I say off-dry, and in, in France it's called demi-sec, but you'll see these on the labels, when I say off-dry, there's a slight hint of residual sugar, not sugar added, but where fermentation doesn't go to completion and they leave a little bit of sugar. Uh, how interesting. And, okay. and, oh, and, yeah. and people relate Rieslings and Gewürztraminer to very sweet wines. They can be dry, a bit off dry or very sweet, you know, dessert style. So I think in terms of those types of wines that would go well with any or all of those dishes together. If I now go, to red wines. Oh, the other thing you could do is a rosé. But here I here I recommend a dry rosé. And people say I only drink rosé in the summer. That's not a good thought. Rosés can be enjoyed all year long. I tend to enjoy them in the cooler months with a little bit less chill. In the warmer months, I chill them a little more to bring out more of the acidity. But uh, a beautiful dry rosé, maybe something from Taval or Bandol, or even domestically, and that you can buy rosés that have their varietals from Italian varietals, Spanish varietals, French varietals. Pick what you want, but don't pick white Zinfandel. That's not a rosé. Okay, a what, is white, what is white Zinfandel? A blush wine. A blush wine. And how is that different? What is that? Too mean? sweet. Too sweet. So a rosé. And I tend to look at maybe the little richer, fuller bodied rosés, you know, with with um, this menu of choices that you laid out, something perhaps from Bandol, B-A-N-D-O-L, Bandol region of the south of France is really very good. Maybe a Pinot Noir rosé, you know, from Sonoma would be very good. And then if you go into the reds, again, I would stick with the acidity. So I'm thinking in terms of Barbera. Mm. Sangiovese, which is also available as Chianti, uh, and a wide variety of others, uh, I would not go to I would not go to the Beaujolais with this because it's not going to have enough stand-up body. But I'd say Sangiovese, Carignan, uh, uh, well, Sangiovese, Carignan. And not not Pinot Noir, not Cabernet, not Zinfandel. Okay, let's move on to Hanukkah foods. My last name is Rosenberg. Everybody knows. Uh, most of my friends refer to me as Rosen Jew. I am Jewish, and I love Hanukkah foods. All right, here they are. Ready? Go ahead and drink. You can answer. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I love how you don't just you don't just swallow it, right? You don't put it in your mouth like I have a glass of water. I throw it down the old gullet. I don't really take my time with it. I notice as I'm watching you, you put it in your mouth. It seems to sit there, have a little party, and then it travels down through to the, to the rest of your body. That's right. right. It's a little bit of a different process. We'll get to yeah. that. Okay. We'll get to that. For now, let's focus right now on Hanukkah foods because I want to talk about potato latkes. And by the way, Katz's Deli, potato latkes, boom, in case you're wondering. Matzo ball soup, brisket, uh, sweet noodle kugel, and roast chicken. Those are all possibilities. And very often, as you say, they can be on the table at the same time. That's right. So how would you pair with those things? You know, with, with Hanukkah, and our, our menus are about the same. We don't typically have chicken, but we do have the brisket and such. And, and they are served sort of in courses, but the potato latkes with the sour cream and the applesauce. And by the way, I grew up eating table latkes with French's mustard. People Did you still not have roast chicken on your Hanukkah? I had roast chicken on my Hanukkah table. No, we, we, we've never done it, but it's okay. It'll fit in. Yeah. Uh, here, 
you can tend to go back to some of your regular standbys. Uh, for example, uh, a nice Sauvignon Blanc uh, would go beautifully with the gefilte fish and also continue to pair. I didn't actually with speak the, of filter fish, but that's good. That's good information. Oh, to have I, okay. I threw that one in because that's what we have instead of chicken. And okay. Yeah. Why so, not? But, yeah. but with the filter fish or with the soup, a very nice Sauvignon Blanc would go. Now I'm not saying so much the New Zealand style, which is a little bit too acidic for this particular pairing. Here you want to stay toward the midweights uh, or a, a lighter Chardonnay yeah. But the Chardonnay, you have to watch out for the oak. You know, you don't want a lot of oak in it. And then as you go to the main course, which brisket or roast chicken, and there's no such thing as, you know, uh, red wine with meat, white wine with chicken and fish. There are crossovers in that. Mm -hmm. So either the roast chicken or the brisket, I would go to maybe a Carignan. Uh, I would think perhaps of a Tempranillo. Uh, I think maybe uh, perhaps something that is a little more cutting like a, a Mataro. And Mataro is what we call it in California, but the other names are Movedra from France, it's part of the Southern Rhone, or Monostrel from Spain. So if you ask for Mataro, Monostrel, Movedra, you're gonna get the same thing. But there, the, the, again, they, these red wines have a bit more acidity to them. And the acidity cuts through the fat of the brisket and the fatty skin of the chicken. Huh. So, and, and you still have the savory flavors, but you wanna cut through the fat. And the best thing to cut through fat with wine is acidity. And by acidity, that's not battery acid. Acidity is the brightness in wine. Hmm and is the, one of the most important components and really is the key component along with tannin for aging. Oh, interesting, we'll get to that. So let's hit Christmas. Now this one, I put a list of foods together that actually are more common to individual states, like the most common Christmas main in a given state, but instead we're gonna imagine that they're just all on one table, like right in the middle of the country, we'll call it Kentucky. Okay, so I have prime rib, turkey, gumbo, crab cakes, and baked cod. Now, I'm just going to tell you what the states were anyway. I think it's an interesting little fact right here. The prime rib primarily in Alaska, the turkey in Connecticut, gumbo, of course, Louisiana, crab cakes, again, of course, from Maryland, and baked cod from New Jersey. I love, okay. by the way, I love, love, love cod. It's like one of my favorite foods in the world. Can't what wait to hear what Christmas, I should be drinking with it. What about the Christmas ham? Of course. Did I not say that? No. Oh, gosh. It's right there in my note, right there. Ham, okay. Christmas ham. Also Christmas ham. <laughs> okay. No, now here, the Christmas dinner is going to be served more in courses. You're not going to have the gumbo on the same plate as you're going to have the, the prime rib or the ham. So with, with the meats, the prime rib or the steak, like it was, you know, steak is, a, is an important part of the Christmas meal uh, in England uh, and New Year's. Uh, with those, I, I would go to Cabernet or a Bordeaux or something more traditional that people, or a, a, a weighty Merlot. With the uh, ham, that's a tricky dish because it's, it's salty and so, I go with two different, uh, two, two different choices, each to bring out a different character of the ham. The, the uh, Chardonnay, again, light, lightly oaked, if at all, Chardonnay uh, would tame the saltiness of the ham, whereas Pinot Noir would bring out the savoriness of the ham. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an odd thing that you compare a white and a red with the same dish, but it, it works fine. You just have to figure out what you want to do or do both. Put two glasses and let your guests be the judge. I'm going to say do both. <laughs> yeah. And then and then when you go to the salt cod and such, you know, there I'm thinking a, a brighter white wine, like an Assertico, uh from Greece or perhaps a Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris uh, domestically or from Pinot Grigio, Italy, Pinot Gris, France, and Alsace. Uh, 
uh, those would go well with the, you know, with the cod. But in general, what I think you, do, you want to do is think about the flavors of the food, the flavors of the flavor and the texture of the wine. And it's a mixed bag on Christmas, but usually, thankfully, they are served separately. So you can fill the glass with a white, then go to a red or whatever. Gotcha. Okay. Did I leave any of your dishes out? No, I don't think so. Um, did you mention the crab cakes, actually? Oh, the crab cakes. I would definitely do something uh, a very light, you know, a, a light uh, Chardonnay or a weightier Sauvignon Blanc. Got so it. that fits in with those. There are other things, you know, there, you know, I would stay away from the aromatic whites for that. You know, the Roussan and the Marsan and the Viognier's, those would be good for other things, but hmm. I would stay away from, I, I'd stay with simple choices for the crab cakes. Alan, I want to thank you. Uh, this has really been interesting for me. I am the kind of person that just, I sometimes will buy it, just looking at the label, if it has a fun thing like a vampire face on it, I'll buy it just because it's red and vampire. I don't know. I have no, no other reason than that. I now know a whole bunch more that I didn't know. And particularly, I feel quite prepared for the holidays. So I want to keep on being prepared. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I can access your biweekly column. So what's the best way to do that? Well, it's uh, NapaNews.com yeah. slash Alan Balick. Right. And that's the Napa, Napa Valley Register. NapaNews.com slash Alan Balick. A-L-L-E-N-B-A-L-I-K. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link right down there, guys, so you can get right to Alan's stuff. Definitely worth a read. Guys, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your holiday. Alan, thank you so much for thank coming you. and this sharing is... your expertise with us. Really, I'm grateful. Thank you. It's been fun. I hope we can do it again. Indeed, we will. And happy holidays to all the, all the viewers. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey, this is Phil Rosenberg from the Phil Rosenberg Show. I wanted to thank everyone for stopping by and checking out my page. And let you know that you can head on over to my YouTube page if you'd like to, the Phil Rosenberg Show over there as well. And to let you know that I'm going to be releasing my shows on this very page a couple times a week. You'll be able to catch a whole bunch of stuff that I do. And definitely leave a comment if you feel like it. Like the page, follow, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Thanks again for popping by.